Uh, should warn you that this morning is going to be a bit more difficult. Um, and I'm going to adapt the lecture style very much this morning because, uh, you know, I've not got much blackboard space in here. And also, I think today is probably the only lecture where the maths is going to be more important than the physics because I'm going to be introducing some vector identities which are very important in the, you know, which we'll use when we do the unification theory in week four. First, though, let's start, good, good place in a physics lecture, with a bit of physics. Where we got to last time was that we solved the uh, magnetic field for a solenoid. And we can certainly, because of its very high symmetry, we can solve the straight wire purely from Ampere's law. We didn't need to use that the divergence of the magnetic field was equal to zero. We could uh, effectively, with the straight wire, just use that the curl of the magnetic field is equal to, excuse me, a little arrowhead missing here, equal to the permeability of free space times the current density. So these are the laws of steady currents, and nature just presents us with that. If nature presented us with magnetic monopoles, with magnetic fields that diverge from a point, this wouldn't be true. If Ampere's law wasn't true experimentally for steady currents, then this wouldn't be true. This is really the physics. This relates the magnetic field to its source. There are no point sources of magnetism. The only source is this steady current. Now, I said also we could use equation 5 to, to solve the solenoid, but that is kind of like only we were sort of using, in, using intuitively that the field lines had to stay parallel inside the solenoid. We were using the experimental fact, if you like, that the field's big inside the solenoid and very small outside. So, and again, I, I, it's very important to point out because I know it misleads a lot of people about magnetism. They think, oh, well, what about a magnet? That's not got a flowing current, and yet it's producing a magnetic field. And if I put a bar magnet there, I get just the same field. So to emphasise, although it's not a real current, we'll come to this at the very end of the course, a bar magnet is equivalent to something flowing round like a cylinder, exactly as in a solenoid. So the bar magnet and the solenoid are actually, in terms of their fields, extremely similar. So we were able to analyse the magnetic field uh, <coughs> inside the solenoid with this intuitive idea that del dot b was naught, and we came to this very nice, simple result that it's equal to mu naught times the number of turns per unit length times the current, an extremely simple formula, although the argument was quite sophisticated. We used Stokes' theorem and we applied it to that little rectangular loop and the only non-zero leg of the loop was the one inside the ma material and uh, in that case the loop was parallel to the field and we got the st uh, straight to that simple formula. Now that's all very well, but you know, <coughs> obviously as physicists we'd like to solve more than the straight wire and the solenoid. And uh, it's, uh, we're going to come to the bios of our law um, on uh, Friday. Uh, what happens if we wanted to find the magnetic field at some point here? This is, this is just deliberately done to be a very asymmetric circuit. You know, we probably wouldn't really make a circuit like this with a kind of weird curly loop in it. And the current is now flowing round in some way that's not got a high symmetry, and we're at some other point in space, and we want to know what the magnetic field is. Of course, in all practical problems, uh, we have to solve in lower symmetry fields. And, uh, you know, we can't leave everything up to the engineers. You know, we have to do a bit of hard work ourselves. So how do we attack this problem? And the way we attack it is uh, via a so-called vector potential. So, first of all, obviously, we're going to be dealing with the, the, the curl of a uh, magnetic field. And uh, a lot of today, as I say, will be, if you like, pure vector calculus that we need. And in a way today, I'd advise you, uh, in a sense, not to take notes, because I'm going to actually lay down view graphs of the notes that are on the VLE, so the notes will be identical anyway to what's there, and you can 
just look them up. The important thing is actually to be convinced that these vector identities are true, so that when we come back, you won't think, oh, so, you know, Martin unified, did, did the Maxwell unification theory, but he used a kind of bit of um, jiggery-pokery uh, mathematics to prove it. So uh, that's going to be the theme. So first of all, obviously, we've got to know what the curl is. And I uh, hope everybody is completely familiar with what's on this view graph, that you can represent it, if you like, as this determinant. and uh, to write out the components explicitly, the x component of the curl is d by dy of cz minus d by dz of cy with similar relationships for the uh, y and z components of the vector field. So that is so basic, I think we can pass straight on from that one. That's the basic definition of the curl. Now, I say I'm going to use the lecture notes um, from last time. Um, I mentioned already that we've covered part of Lecture 5 on the vector potential, that I reorganised the course uh, slightly. And uh, the first two pages of the lecture notes on the um, vector potential were just what I did when I did, went through Stokes' theorem. You know, and again, we just did it slightly Blue Peter method. You know, I actually cut this loop literally across here and showed that the circulation around this loop Times the plus the circulation times this loop because the pieces in the middle cancel was still the circulation of the outer loop and then we imagine cutting it up into lots of very small squares and all we've got to do to work out the circulation around one of these small squares is simply do these four legs. We did that in the lecture and we got the circulation around this small square which is lying in the xy plane to be equal to this. Now clearly this is, just we've just seen it, this is by definition the z component of the curl. So again, you know, uh, and I know people were shaky, that's why I asked you, you know, where is the curl pointing? The curl is pointing out of the plane, it's along the z-axis, and that's uh, also represented here, that we've got to consider the normal component of the curl to the loop. And of course that's intuitively non-obvious. So, before we get into the straight mathsy bit, uh, again, an analogy. I mean, be careful, of course, always with analogies. This is not a perfect analogy. But clearly, in steady state magnetism, we've got to deal with a field that's got zero divergence and a finite curl. An, an example mechanically, which is sort of, you know, makes it feel more obvious, is the velocity field. I, I could define the velocity of each atom in this disk as a, a, a vector field, and that would be well defined at every point. Again, we're assuming the matter is smeared out continuously, just like we assume in the magnetism that the field is smeared out uh, continuously, varies continuously from point to point. And clearly, after one circuit of this disk, the, you know, the atoms haven't gone anywhere. They've gone back to all their original positions. They're not diverging anywhere. The atoms aren't flying off to infinity. They're just coming back to the same place. So this velocity field has got zero divergence. However, uh, there's clearly something going on, and there's clearly a circulation of the velocity field around the axis, and there is therefore a non-zero curl. There's a non-zero circulation, so by Stokes' theorem, there's a non-zero curl. And again, I've put it on, if you like, here in red to emphasise, this is the direction of the curl of V, it seems counterintuitive at first, but it is along the z-axis. The circulation is in this plane, if this is the xy plane, and the curl is perpendicular to the plane. So that's the, um, the macker. And I should say, you know, to be particularly careful with the analogy, let's say, uh, uh, you know, of course, at any point, the velocity field here will be getting greater and greater as we go to the rim of the disk, whereas the magnetic field, if this was a current carrying wire and we were looking at the magnetic field lines going down, as we saw, it's a one over R field. So don't take this analogy too seriously. It's just to give you an idea of what we mean by having uh, a zero divergence and a finite curl. Now, one thing that we definitely can't do is exp express such a field in terms of a 
scalar potential. Now, as I say, I've covered uh, the first two lines, and because of the, say, the restricted space, this is not a technique I'm particularly keen on, but I'm going to just go put up view graphs. Of course, I have some other view graphs too, but put up view graphs of the notes that are already on the VLE. So you don't, uh, of course, need to um, take notes because they're already there. So precisely, we've reached this point here. We know that these are the laws of magnetism and we've got an analogy with the velocity field of atoms in a rotating disk. So first of all, let's establish it mathematically straight away. You definitely can't express this in terms of a scalar uh, field because if the any, and I'm going to use psi for any scalar field and c for any vector field. And uh, the, this distinguishes it from, uh, remember I've used phi for the electrostatic potential and I've used, of course, e for the electric field. An example is precisely this. And as we know, the laws of electrostatics are just the other way around. We've got a finite divergence and a zero curl. Um, so, then, if this is true, then the curl must be equal to zero. Okay, so uh, the curl of a gradient is equal to zero. And that's the first of three very important things that I'm going to prove in this lecture. So, let's uh, prove that, and it is extremely straightforward. So... Again, uh, it might be worth making one or two notes on our one available blackboard. This is all. Oh dear. Managed to lose my microphone at this point. Let's, see, let's try again here. Can you, is that okay, Hugo? Yeah? So, uh, this board is going to be pure maths. One, the gradient of a curl, excuse me, let's get it right way round, vector operators are rather important to get in the right way, the curl of a gradient is zero. So in other words, the curl and the mathematical symbols is null. And I'm going to emphasise today so, you see, sometimes when you write it in this upside-down down triangle way and we use the operators, it obscures that they're actually very straightforward to prove just by writing out the components. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So, we know that the x component of the curl is equal to dcz by dy minus dcy by dz. That's just a basic definition. Now, if this C can be expressed as the gradient of a scalar field, well, its Z component then has to be d psi by dz, and its Y component has to be d psi by dy. Couldn't be otherwise. So now, in this case, if I look at the X component of the curl, it's d by dy of Cz minus d by dz of Cy. So it's d2 psi by dy dz minus d2 psi by dz dy. And we've got you know, a basic relationship from partial differentiation, Euler's relation, that this is equal to this, and therefore this is zero. And of course, we could do it, we could write it out similarly for the y and the z components. But again, I can leave that up to you to prove to yourself. In each case, we just get two terms that cancel. So the curl of a gradient must be equal to zero just by writing out the components. So it is completely obvious that this absolutely cannot be true in magnetism. We've got a finite curl. So if it was expressible, if we could write, which we can't, that B is equal to the gradient of some scalar field, then 
rub that out quickly because it was a horrible thing to write down. It can't be true because it would automatically, by pure maths, have a non-zero uh, gradient. See, if we put the electrostatics over here on this side, this is precisely why in electrostatics, we, uh, the, the, where the curl is equal to zero, now exactly we can write E is minus. We use the minus sign because as the potential's going up, the field's pointing down the field lines, just like the heat flow vector is proportional to the negative gradient of the temperature field. Heats, if, if you've got something at 20 degrees here and 10 degrees here, well, the temperature field's going up that way, but the heat's flowing that way. Same idea. So that is what the kind of field we're used to. And precisely, of course, you know, this corresponds to the inverse square laws. But we're now in a totally different world. We cannot use uh, such an approximation. So that was 5.3, um, uh, is that straight away uh, absolutely cannot be expressed by the gradient of a scalar field. So the magnetic field is non-conservative. And again, another way of looking at the same thing there would be, well, the line, it, if the, that's the circulation of the magnetic field, and, of course, if it's got a non-zero curl, as I go round back to the same point, um, I've done work on the system. This, is this, this line, into all, all work has been done on the system. You can either do work or have work done. It's a non-conservative field, unlike Newtonian gravitation and electrostatics. So, that's all very well saying what the magnetic field isn't. What is it? So, again, I'm going in the same spirit to uh, use the, uh, the lecture notes uh, directly. So again, it's just by writing out the components to the divergence of a curl is zero. Mathematically, del dot curl of C is naught. So, this is the second of the three identities that we need. And again, as I say, the second and third one will be crucial when we do the unification theory. So today, I'm going to go it through it component by component. And again, so again, it, it, it's just up on the board there. That's the second um, uh, relationship that we need. And here it is. Well... Well, the curl of C is just a vector. And we can write out, again, this, uh, stress this several times, that there's nothing naff about writing out the components. It's nice to compact them into this you know, very short and powerful notation, but sometimes it makes them look almost mystical. Oh, you know, the divergence of a curl. But it's a really simple creature, because this is, by definition here, A1, A2, A2, A2 to A4, oh, all I've done is just explicitly write out what we had uh, as elementary definition of the curl. Well, there aren't that many pieces to do when we take its divergence. The divergence is d by dx of the x component plus d by dy of the y component plus d by dz of the z component. Well, let's do the first one. That is, d this is d to c z by dx dy. That's taking d by dx here, and then minus, again, if I let's move this down, make it a bit easier for me to, to reach. Uh, this is precisely now, um, di so these two terms here are d by dx of this component plus d by dy of this component plus d by dz of this component. There are only six pieces to add up. And here we go again. Oh, you can see I've just collected them up in pairs. This one cancels this one. This one, excuse the, the blob there, it is a curly D under, under, under that, cancels this one. And this one cancels this one. So the divergence of a curl is zero. We've only got six terms to add up. It's not rocket science, but it's important that you are completely confident. Just, it's only writing out the components, you get this result here. 
So the divergence of a curl is zero. And again, this comes back, again, I've said be careful with just analogies and comparing an operator with a vector. But again, we had, oops, when we did uh, maths last year, that um, we have got uh, this relationship is very similar to the relationship for ordinary vectors. And we know why. Because A cross B is perpendicular to the plane containing A and B, well then A is now dotted with something to which it is perpendicular. And if you dot product two perpendicular vectors, you get naught. So again, be careful with analogies like that. Strictly speaking, of course, you should write out all the components of the operator. So the divergence of a curl is zero. And this gives us the clue of how to solve magnetism. Because if I express B as the curl of some vector field A, we come to what this vector field is if I express B as the curl of a vector field A, I'm automatically going to fulfill this equation. So from the start, if I make this approach to the problem, I'm definitely going to always have a field that has zero divergence. So this is exactly the thing called the vector potential. And <coughs> so we'll now go back. That, again, that was the pure maths there. Um, and we'll come back now to how it all pans out. So, exactly because of this purely mathematical relationship, the sort of underlined with that dosh dotted li dosh dat line there, we can always find a field A that we can express the magnetic field as the curl of A because precisely we now guarantee that when we take the divergence of the magnetic field expressed in this way, we get naught. So this is how we build in precisely the idea of a, uh, a new kind of object. And again, it is conceptually challenging today because you've dealt always with scalar potentials. This is your first introduction to what is called the vector potential. A, this field A is the vector potential. So in electrostatics, what we can always do is shift the field by some constant. Because when I take the gradient of this thing, if I have E is equal to minus del phi prime, where phi prime is phi plus C, obviously I get the same electric field. Because when I take the gradient of a constant, I get nothing. And take the derivatives of a constant, I get naught. So we've got an arbitrary choice of the zero of potential. And, uh, and ag again, typical example, a gravitational field, let's just say uh, here, V equals mgh, close to the Earth's surface. Because it's a 1D problem, my dV by dH is equal to mg, so my minus dv by dh is minus mg. It doesn't matter where I choose my zero of height in this problem, I get the same acceleration in this field. I have the same force and the same acceleration. So I've got this arbitrary freedom. Now a similar thing exists with the vector field, but it's again a little more subtle. And the subtlety is that Oops, let's get the right, uh, right view graph here. As usual, the view graph sh shuffling monster has done its job. So now, in this case, I can add the gradient of any scalar field to A and still get the mag same magnetic field. So the idea now, because if I take the curl of A prime, where A is, uh, I've added a scalar field. When I take the curl of this, I get the curl of A, which is precisely the magnetic field, plus the curl of this gradient. Well, the curl of this gradient is definitely equal to zero. So now I can shift my whole vector field A by the gradient of any scalar field psi. Because when I take the gradient of a prime, I get the curl of A, which is B, plus zero. 
so I get the same magnetic field, B. So I can now shift my vector potential by the great... Uh, I've got, of course, I've got to add to it another vector field. You know, you've got to uh, add a vector to a vector. But I get the, um, uh, the, the same field. So again, um, in order to... Th and again, this is now getting into much more advanced physics. And uh, I'll make some comments about how far the kind of exam syllabus goes. You know, I'm not going to ask you to do lots of massive calculations with um, the vector potential. But it's it certainly, if you want to go on the whole way in physics, in particular as a theoretical physicist or mathematical physicist, um, this is now another introduction to something big called a gauge theory. You, when you choose the get, in other words, you choose how you define this delt psi, um, you're called working in a particular gauge. And in magnetostatics, and we'll come back to this, it's not the same choice in electrodynamics, but in magnetostatics, you'll see why in a minute, we choose that the gradient of A will be equal to zero. Just to um, uh, say, emphasize, this won't be the choice for electrodynamics. Uh, and so this is the choice of, ga you, you can always do it, I mean that is exactly, that's just like choosing in a scalar potential whether this is 6,400 you know, kilometres from the, you know, or, or 6,401 or Norton 1, but we're shifting now. Uh, and in a sense, you, you wouldn't, it, it would be a too posh to call it this, uh, that choice is like a gauge in a sense for electrostatics. Just fixing the constants a gauge for electrostatics, fixing this del dot A is naught is choosing the gauge for magnetostatics. So uh, you'll see why we do that uh, in a moment. So I'm going to return now to that basic equation 5-2 uh, and how this works out in the solution. So of course, now we've got our bonus when we put in that this here is the, cur the curl of A because we've got the, yep, we've definitely got that Maxwell equation fulfilled. But now I've got to express my second law as the curl of the curl of A is mu naught J. And this is our third uh, important uh, vector identity which again I'm going to prove it takes slightly longer but it's not particularly difficult. Three, we're going to prove that the curl of the curl of any vector field C is equal to the gradient of its divergence minus the Laplacian applied to the same field. And again, of course, curl of C, as we know, is a vector, and so its curl is a vector. This is a vector because this is a scalar, the divergence, but when we take the gradient of the divergence, we get a vector field, and this is a scalar operator, the Laplacian, applied to a vector, so it gives us a vector. This is a vector equation. Again, I've run out of blackboard space for words, but what it's telling us is that the curl of the curl of any vector field is equivalent to taking the gradient of its divergence and subtracting the Laplacian applied to the same field. So this one uh, does take a slightly longer time, but not a... Uh, uh, and again, as I say, I want you to be convinced that these three things are true. These are crucial steps in, our, in, in Lecture 11. So I want, I, I want you to be convinced that these are true. And here we go. Let's just go through it. Well, again, I'm just going to do it brute force. I'm just going to write out all the components. So there's the curl of the curl. Well, this is the curl of C. That's its x component, that's its y component, that's its z component. So the curl of the curl is we just put in the x component, the y component, and the z component of the curl in the bottom row of the determinant, and then we write it all out. Yeah, and this is again. Don't try. I wouldn't try and scribble all this down at the, you know, at the moment. This is uh, straightforward maths. It's just keeping track of a few terms. So this is the curl of the curl of any vector field C. All I've done is write out its components. No uh, tricks there. Likewise, here is the gradient 
of the divergence of the same field. Here's the, uh, the gradient operator, X component, Y component, Z component, and it's applied to the divergence. So the I component is this, the Z, the y, excuse me, the X component, the Y component, and the Z components of the gradient of the divergence. All I've done is write them out. That's, uh, so that's what this one looks like. Finally, we've got the Laplacian applied to the same vector field. And again, there's not that many terms to write out. There's the Laplacian operator. This is the, ve this is the vector field. So its I component is d2 by dx squared of uh, c <coughs> cx plus d2 by dy squared of cx plus t2 by dz squared of cx. Now again, I'm not going to do it for all the components, I'm just going to do it for the x component, and if you want to prove it to yourselves, um, your, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, it will give you confidence that this is true. So all I've done now is collect up from the first view graph, that was the x component of the curl of the curl, from the, from the second view graph, this was the x component of the gradient of the divergence, and from the third view graph, this was the x component of the Laplacian applied to the function. So all I've got to do is say, well, here I've got uh, my gradient of C here, and I subtract, so I subtract this line from this line, and obviously, when I do the subtraction, the d2cx by dx squared minus, there's a minus sign here, d2 goes, and these are simply the four remaining terms. But those four remaining terms are identical to this line. Therefore, this is precisely when I subtract this line from this line and I get this line, I've proved for the x component that the curl of the curl of the field is given by this expression. So just by writing out the components, you can prove these three relationships. So this is a very important relationship that we'll need later on. Um, so now we can go back. We've, we've done now all the pure maths. These are the three things that I want you to really carry aw away with you from this lecture, that these are true and easy to prove. And so let's go back now to our calculation. Well, now we've got that we've rewritten, and again, this is the crucial thing against Tehan. We've built in, see, this, this is built in, so we've, we've used the fact that the divergence of the field is zero. We put in that there are no magnetic monopoles. So that's the physics. All we've got to do, and it, you know, I'll say all, and there's still a bit to go, is solve this equation. Now, using this vector identity that we've just proved, well, the curl of the curl is this term minus this term. But precisely, and this is why in magnetostatics, remember, we've got that freedom to adjust the gauge of the vector potential. Just like I can adjust the electrostatic potential by a constant, and that's precisely why I make the choice. This is the gauge for magnetostatics that the divergence is zero, because then this term goes to zero. We've chosen this, we're free to do that, and then that reduces the equation to the much nicer del squared A is minus mu naught J. Obviously, I can take the minus sign over to the other side. I put this, because that's zero, I put this operator here, just pop the minus sign across, and I have got del squared A is minus mu naught J. And this, re again, remember, the spirit of this lecture almost entirely, you can just sometimes confuse yourself by writing vector equations. Sometimes it's better to think that is three separate equations. Yeah? Remember, a vector equation, the x components of the vector and the y and the z components have always got to be equal. So the del squared operator applied to the x component of the vector potential gives me minus mu naught times the x component of the current density and similar relationships for the y and z components. So we've got these three equations. And now this is uh, 
The very beautiful thing is that these three equations are all from the mathematician's point of view, identical to Poisson's equation. These three different equations are del squared something is equal to something else. Yeah? So if we've solved an electrostatic problem, and you know we can solve everything in electrostatics by Poisson's equation. Again, remember with Poisson's equation, I'm putting in E is equal to minus del phi, minus del phi, and del dot del, by definition, is del squared. So in other words, any electrostatic problem that I've solved, I now just change the constants. I just change my 1 over epsilon naught into a mu naught. I change my charge density into the appropriate solution for the, current, the appropriate current density, and I solve for that component of the field. I do that. It's harder work than electrostatics, but I just do the same thing three times. Having done it three times, I've got then my vector potential, an analytic function, and then I take its curl. And then I solve the problem. I can solve the magnetic field for any arbitrary distribution of current density in space in the same way that if I'm good enough at maths and integration, I can solve for the electrostatic potential due to any arbitrary charge distribution in space. So again, I'm not going to go back over that. And uh, uh, <coughs> just to say that the kind of thing, electrostatic problems, we are not going to revisit. Likewise, you're only setting out on solution of second order partial differential equations. You haven't done formal solutions to Poisson's equation. But I'm just showing you the machine of how it works. You won't be examined on anything basically to do with the vector potential, but we need it for the more advanced topics we're going to look at. So it's to give, and, and so for example, like again, if you have the electrostatic, you might say, well, why have I gone around this backward route? Why don't I just calculate the magnetic field directly? Same reason why in electrostatics, why do I go via a potential? Well, this 1 over R scalar integral is a lot, lot easier to do than, you see, you know, again, this, this is the, you've got to think this is the equivalent problem to figure 17 in electrostatics. I've got some arbitrary weird distribution of charge, and I want to know the field at some point. Well, if I want to do that in practice, what I actually do, rather than try and solve the electric field directly, as a mathematician, it is so much nicer to simply do one scalar integral and then differentiate it with respect to x, y, and z and get the three components of the electric field. I could, of course, have a crack at the problem absolutely head on. This is the same figure, but now I would solve uh, the electric field. I'd have to think, oh, it's a vector unit quantity. And technically speaking, these 1 over r squared integrals are more difficult because you think the x component of this is x over r cubed. And these integrals can get quite hairy. And it's much easier to go by this route. There's a deeper reason that we'll come back to for defining the vector potential. But at the moment, you can just say, well, it's a nicer route to solve the problem. And so in the end, any electrostatic problem that we have already solved becomes equivalent mathematically to, uh, to magnetostatic problems. If you like, there's three electrostatic problems, and then we have to take the curl rather than the gradient. But once you can do the maths of electrostatics, you can do that. So um, if I can find my last view graph of the lecture five, which should be in here somewhere. While I try and find it, would you like to hear an another not very funny joke? Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? I mean, this has been a, a quite a heavy lecture. And that is, um, of course, I'm not going to ask you to solve for some weird circuits or some weird geometries. The only three geometries that we're going to deal with in this course are spheres, cylinders, and flat plates. Now, my view graphs will fall out their box. Flat plates, cylinders, and spheres. And it's very typical, he said, 
by trying to buy time while he looks for this wretched view graph of physicists to do uh, exactly that. So um, apologies to devotees of the Big Bang Theory who've uh, already heard this one, is that um, you know, there's a, a farmer and his, um, his hens aren't laying eggs. And uh, he's at his wit's end. So he asks a friend, says, well, you know, what should I do? And the friend says, well, I, I, I can't tell you directly, but what I can tell you is theoretical physicists are very clever people. Why don't, I've got a friend who's a theoretical physicist. Um, let's ask her. Note the non-sexist approach there. You know. <laughs> you know. now, now we're going out on YouTube. I wouldn't want to take a sexist rap or anything like that. You know. So, uh, <coughs> so you know, the, 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 the farmers get in introduced to the theoretical physicist, and the theoretical physicist says, um, uh, oh, that's a tricky problem. I have to go away and think about that. And, you know, it goes off and there's these masses and masses of calculations. And um, the next day, he comes back and uh, sees the farmer, and um, he says, I think I've solved your problem. The farmer goes, oh, that's absolutely fantastic. My God, this has been worrying me for months. You know, how, uh, wh what's the answer? And uh, the theoretical physicist says, um, well, before I tell you the answer, I should warn you, it only applies to spherical hens in a vacuum. And, that, and of course, uh, it's sort of kind of like we're going to be doing electrostatics and magnetostatics in that spirit. We're only going to solve for spherical hens in a vacuum. Yeah, yeah. So um, I finally found it. Uh, I don't know, it sort of shuffled its way in, in between some of the others. So this is the final page of the, uh, of the, uh, of the handout. And that is, uh, therefore, by analogy, you see... Uh, because I've used the analogy with Poisson's equation, all I've done is replace the formula for the electrostatic potential. As I say, I've made the appropriate substitutions. So, you know, my, my 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught out front has become a mu naught over 4 pi, and I've replaced my integral over a charge density with my integral over a current density. Remember, there are three of these integrals in this case, one for the x component, and this is referring, this one in brackets is the point at which I want to calculate the field, and the two in brackets is the point at which there is a charge uh, element uh, in amps per square meter, and if I integrate, you know, it's the same problem. If I integrate that over all volume elements occupied by current density, it's a, as a one over r. It's an identical equation, but I've just changed the constants. There are similar equations for a y and a z, and then. I express it, re-express it in vector form because, again, you know, we like to have a compact notation in physics that this is the vector potential at point one due to the uh, char all charge, uh, all e volume elements of space occupied by currents integrated over those volumes. So if you go through equation 517 gives us a general method for finding the magnetic field of steady currents because you can always solve for A by doing these integrals and then you solve for B. As I say, I'm not pretending this isn't the case. This is a very challenging lecture. This is a bit more complicated than electrostatics, but it's the same idea. So that the only case that we're going to apply it to is the straight current carrying wire. And I'm going to, in the next lecture, start off by proving that it gives the same result. Now, you might think, well, we could, we could solve that directly with Ampere's law. Why bother? It's to give you confidence that this method works. Because actually, it's not that difficult a calculation for a straight current carrying wire. And the advantage of doing it this way is that you know the electrostatic field in this geometry. So, a little, little test for you. Um, as I say, worst that can happen is to make a complete fool of yourself in front of everybody in the world on YouTube, uh, is, well, what is the magnitude? We know that if I've got a line charge, yeah, a line charge going along, and I put a cylindrical Gaussian surface around it, what is the electric field and the electric potential as a function of distance from the wire? Can anyone remember any first-year electrostatics? Oh, it's gone 
horribly quiet in here. Horribly quiet. Well, we have a one over, uh, <coughs> we have a logarithmic potential and a one over our field. And it would be useful for you if you, you, you know, it's in Young and Friedman, it's in your notes from last year. Uh, I'll use that in the calculation next time. So, um, I, in other words, because I've solved the electrostatics, it sounds weird, it's a very different problem having a, ch a lot of static charges along a line to solve the electric field around it, but I'm going to use that solution to solve the magnetic problem of a current flowing in a straight line and to find the magnetic field line circulating around it because I'm going to map this electrostatic problem onto this magnetostatic problem. Now, before we go, we've still got uh, about five minutes. Um, I've, I've left out a little bit of the course, which uh, was uh, in um, lecture three on the VLE notes. And um, this is a good moment to just say, well, what was that all about? And the reason I want to bring it up now is when you do all this stuff, all, oh, you know, the curl of the curl of a vector field, it all sounds very abstract. And to remind you, we are trying to describe raw phenomena. Although we're going to use this pure mass, we're trying to describe physics. And figures 7 to 12 in the... Figures 1 to 6 were just basic electrostatics, bit of revision, electrostatics of a spherical uh, charge distribution, whether it's a point or, a, or, or a, 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 a sphere with some kind of diff charge density inside it. Um, to remind you, and when I said at the beginning, all of electromagnetism is contained in the Maxwell equations, that will give us all, we will be able to calculate the fields in any circumstances, including dynamic fields. It's, if you like, just, mecha just mechanics, but you also need the Lorentz force law, the F, of course, in general, we've got that F is equal to QE plus QV cross B. So I'm not going to do anything on the motion of charged particles in electric and magnetic fields. You've already done Newtonian mechanics, Lagrangian mechanics. Once you've got a field, and you could, if exactly, if in every circumstance we can, we can find this and this, uh, sorry, this, <laughs> this, is, this is the velocity crossed. This isn't a del. This is a velocity, little v, with a big arrow, not a del. This is the velocity of the charged particle um, cross product with the magnetic field. You can work out the force, and then you can work out the motion of the particles. Uh, and, and the spirit of this course is we're going to concentrate on how to get this and this, and assume that if we, uh, if we got those, we can apply our knowledge of mechanics to work out how everything moves as a result of these forces. So, just to remind you uh, what these show, in figure seven, we've just uh, got a bar magnet, and of course it's producing a yeah, bar magnet, as we've seen, it's like a solenoid, the field lines going like this. Directly above the magnet, the field lines are pointing in this direction from the North Pole. Of course, eventually, these field lines will come back in a bundle to the South Pole. There's no curl to the magnetic field. Magnetic field lines have always got to make complete loops. They can't diverge anywhere. But just to the above here, we can assume the magnetic field's directly upwards. Well, if we've got some electrons flowing along the wire, the force is at right angles to both, and so the force is sideways. And we really do see that. If you have a current carrying wire, this is real, ordinary, simple phenomena. If you've got a current carrying wire and you put a, a bar magnet next to it, it twitches to the side. This really happens. You know, we're studying real phenomena in magnetism. Similarly, the magnetic field exerts a force on the magnet. Action and reaction are always equal and opposite, except they're not in electrodynamics. We're going to have to give up some of our little prejudices that we've come in. That's Newtonian mechanics. And I should say, too, if there's any contradiction between what I tell you in this lecture course and what you've learned in mechanics so far, the mechanics is wrong. Elec no, no, the Maxwell equations, uh, there's no exceptions to them. Laws of mechanics, well, you, you know, make them up as you go along, don't you? 
sorry, apologies to Roddy. He's taught you some great stuff, but, uh, but of course, classical mechanics was overthrown by relativity, which came from electrodynamics. So, uh, and indeed, that's precise. You know, you probably did this at school current carrying wire. Uh, all that a, 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 an iron filing is, is a tiny little magnet. Or you can have finely suspended compass needles, and they all point like this. You know, it's a, you can actually put a, a, an, an exactly, when, when a compass flickers, that's exactly this effect. A compass is just a tiny suspended bar magnet. And so, of course, the magnet gets pushed the other way. In this case, magnetostatics, action and reaction really are equal and opposite. And if the wire gets pushed to the left, the magnet gets pushed to the right. But again, to stress, it's a real phenomenon. Similarly, if you've got two wires carrying currents, they exert forces on each other. So, and indeed, that's precisely what's used to define the ampere. You know, two parallel current carrying wires, which we happen to have infinitesimally thin in a vacuum, like a, you know, like a linear chicken in a vacuum interacting with another linear chicken in a vacuum. And they really do, and that force is precisely used to define the ampere. So, um, anyway, uh, there's one or two more phenomena to study, but hey, we've got another 30 odd lectures, so let's save something for Friday. Yeah. <coughs>